The U.S.-led NATO military alliance is waging a proxy war on Russia and Ukraine. The West is also waging an economic war on Russia with several rounds of very aggressive sanctions. And at the same time, the United States is escalating its economic war on China. This is all part of the new Cold War. It's not only against Russia. It is very much also against China. And this October, we saw a very aggressive step escalating the economic war taken by the Joe Biden administration. The Biden administration announced new sanctions, a kind of economic attack on China that prohibit the export of advanced semiconductor technology, microchips, and parts for supercomputers. This is a huge blow to the Chinese economy, and it not only is it an economic war on China, it is part of a technological war on China. Now, we've seen this new Cold War go on for several years. Biden didn't start it. You really can go back to the beginning of it in the Obama administration in the first term under the Hillary Clinton State Department, which now announced a so-called pivot to Asia, which, as Brian Becker often says, that means pivot to war in Asia. And then the U.S. was really trying to take these aggressive measures to contain China in the Pacific. The U.S. sent a lot of military forces into the Pacific region. And then under Trump, the U.S. drastically escalated its new Cold War on China into a trade war that Trump started. Trump imposed many sanctions on China targeting companies like Huawei. And that leads us now to the Biden administration, which has continued Trump's very aggressive policies, especially economic and technology policies against China. And this this brings me to an important article that was published in Foreign Policy magazine. This is called Biden is now all in on taking out China. Now, Foreign Policy magazine is the establishment mouthpiece for the Washington, D.C. foreign policy elites, right? The bipartisan imperialists from both the Republican and Democratic parties who support the U.S. empire, who support war and sanctions and these very aggressive policies. There are some debates inside Foreign Policy magazine between the, you know, the, the neoconservative hawks and the more, uh, you know, restrained supporting liberals, but there's very little debate. It's really a false debate. Everyone supports the U.S. empire, and it has a revolving door with the U.S. government. This article is very interesting. That, that's why I want to look at this article, because it acknowledges that the U.S. is waging an all-out economic and technological war in China, and it's, by, it's written by a former Pentagon official who was an analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA. So I think it's really important to study these reports and, and take what they say seriously, to think about what they're saying, because these are the foreign policy elites in Washington. They're writing these articles for their colleagues in the Beltway bubble. So I, I want to go through some of the main points of this article, because it, it says a really, it says a lot about the new Cold War that Washington is waging against China. So he begins this article noting that the United States has waged low-grade economic warfare against China for at least four years. So acknowledging that the U.S. economic war in China has gone on now at least four years, going back to the Trump administration. And then it had, that has included U.S. tariffs, export controls, investment blocks, visa limits, and much more. And this analyst here, again, this is a U.S. government, a, fi a former U.S. government official. I'll, I'll talk about who he is in a second. I just want to summarize some of the main points of his article. He, he says that the Trump administration's policies against China were scattershot and erratic, and they offered little clarity. On the other hand, he says the Joe Biden administration has been much more systematic. So he's acknowledging that this is bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats alike both support the new Cold War in China. He's saying that Trump's policies were much more chaotic, whereas the Biden administration's are much more systematic. So then he notes that this October, the Bureau of Industry and Security, which is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, it imposed these new sanctions on China that limit the export of advanced semiconductors, chip-making equipment, 
and supercomputer components. So he says that this is a massive escalation of the US economic war on China. He says the primary damage to China will be economic. And he showed, he said that these, these policies from the Biden administration were imposed with only after limited consultation with partner countries and companies, proving that the US government's quest to hobble China ranks well above concerns about the diplomatic or economic repercussions. He says, in short, America's restrictionists, those are the hardcore anti-China hawks. He calls them zero-sum thinkers who urgently want to, ec to accelerate the technological decoupling, have won the strategy inside the Biden administration. So he's saying that the most hawkish anti-China perspective has won out and is now the policy of the Biden administration. He says, cautious, more cautious voices, and he himself, of course, is included among these more cautious voices. He says, the more cautious voices, technocrats, technocrats and centrists who advocate incremental curbs on select aspects of China's tech ties have lost. So he says, what this means is that he expects even harsher U.S. measures to come, not only in advanced computing, but in other sectors. So he expects the U.S. government to attack China's biotech sector, its manufacturing sector, and its finance sector. And he said, the U.S. strategic objective and political commitment are now clearer than ever. The U.S. goal is that China's technological rise must be slowed at any price. So here he's saying, once again, this is the headline in Foreign Policy magazine, Biden is now all in on taking out China. So he's saying that the U.S. is all in in its economic and technological war on China. So who is the guy that wrote this article? His name is John Bateman, and he's a senior fellow at the Technology and Inter International Affairs Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. This is a U.S. government-funded think tank. I'll show in a second who funds it. This is a complete mouth a mouthpiece for the ruling class in Washington. It, it represents the U.S. government's interests, corporations' interests, U.S. allies' interests. I'll show that in a second. But more about this author. Again, because I'm going to go back to this article in a second. But I, when, you when you read these articles, when you analyze these articles, it's important to understand who the author is, what perspective the author is writing from, in order to get an idea of what people in Washington, in these think tanks, are saying. Because there is a debate going on. They're all anti-China. No one is pro-China. No one is pro-Russia. They're all anti-Russia. They're all anti-China. But, as he acknowledged in his article, there are the hardcore neoconservative forces who are extreme hawks, who want war with China, war with Russia, want to overthrow the Russian Chinese governments immediately. And then there are people who are a little more restrained, and John Bateman would consider himself more in the restrained camp, although he's still deeply anti-China, and I'll show that in a second. So it's important to get an idea of this debate going on in Washington. This guy, John Bateman, before he joined this Washington think tank, he worked in the Pentagon, and he was the special assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford. So he was a, an important figure in, in the Pentagon. Before that, he served as director for cyber strategy implementation in the office of the Secretary of Defense. So again, another important figure in the Pentagon. And before that, he was a senior intelligence analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA. So this guy represents the perspective of a technocrat working in the Pentagon. And now he's at this think tank, but once again, all of these think tanks have a revolving door at the U.S. government. They represent a kind of neoliberal outsourcing, a privatization of government research. Instead, it's done through these think tanks that are funded by the government in the case of the Carnegie Endowment, but they're also funded by a bunch of corporations. Here is the most recent annual report, 2021 annual report from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. If you go down to the donors, you can see... They include uh, the, the British Foreign Office, the U.S. European Command, so that's the U.S. military. So it's funded by the U.S. military in Britain. It's funded by Facebook. It's also funded by the Koch 
oligarchs, these right-wing billionaire oligarchs, and it's funded by Open Society Foundations. That is the foundation of the liberal billionaire oligarch, George Soros. So it's funded by both the Kochs and Soros, uh, representing the two main factions in, in, you know, bourgeois politics in the U.S. and Europe. It's funded by the Ford Foundation, which is a longtime CIA cutout. It's funded by Bank of America, the Gates Foundation, Microsoft, Korea, Norway, Japan, the UK again, the US State Department, Google, Canada, Germany, the European Union, that's the European Commission. So you get the point. This think tank represents the establishment perspective of the US government and its allies and large corporations. So now let's go back to this author here, John Bateman. Just so people understand that he's not like a pro-China advocate in the Pentagon. There aren't any. This, this is a report that he wrote at the Carnegie Endowment. And the report is titled, U.S.-China Technological Decoupling, a Strategy and Policy Framework. And he talks about, oh, uh, he, this. he published this in April 2022, so very recently. And this is a strategy that this former Pentagon official presents for how the U.S. government can have a gradual decoupling of its economy and its tech sector from China. So he's advocating for decoupling, that is breaking off the U.S. tech and economic relations with China. He's not advocating for more or better China relations. He is anti-China, but this, in this report, he argues for what he calls a more moderate perspective. So he wants to technologically, he wants to technologically decouple from China more gradually over time and not immediately. In the report, he writes that he is offering a concrete picture of what a centrist decoupling might look like and how implementation could work at the agency level. So once again, this is the perspective that this guy is writing from. When we, when we, when we read his article in Foreign Policy, when we keep all of that in mind, we can now understand this debate going on in elite foreign policy circles in Washington. So let's continue looking at his article here. Again, it's titled, Biden is now all in on taking out China. He notes that the U.S. government has something called the entity list, and this bars certain firms from importing U.S. goods. And in the past four years, the number of Chinese companies on that list, the, the U.S. government's blacklist, quadrupled from 130 in 2018 to now, as of this year, 532 Chinese companies. So those companies include leading Chinese chip companies, supercomputing organizations, and software and hardware vendors. So this is part of this strategy of technological decoupling and economic decoupling. The U.S. is waging economic war on these Chinese tech companies by preventing them from importing U.S. goods to try to disrupt their, their industry. And he notes, of course, the most well-known example of this is Huawei. And he said that it's faced a supercharged version of this blacklist. And he said that the U.S. tactics to try to destroy Huawei grievously wounded the company. Those extreme policies the U.S. took against Huawei included basically forcing Canada to kidnap its chief financial officer, by the way, Meng Wanzhou, who was held in Canada in house arrest for years as the U.S. tried to extradite her. So he says that, you know, this, this U.S. economic war that we saw on, on Huawei was the beginning, and it has, it has completely expanded now. And he said that the, the new sanctions that the Biden administration imposed on China's tech sector effectively bring all of China under the special rule that was formerly reserved only for Huawei. So again, that's to say that this is an, a massive tech war on China's tech sector. He notes that advanced semiconductors from any country will be presumptively denied to every Chinese company, even firms lacking direct ties to Beijing's military or intelligence services. This will hamstring the development and deployment of artificial intelligence throughout the country, hindering Chinese progress in e-commerce, autonomous vehicles, cybersecurity, medical imaging, drug discovery, climate modeling, and much else. So again, what he's saying here is that this is a U.S. tech war to prevent China from advancing in artificial intelligence science. 
the U.S. is trying to prevent China from becoming a leader in scientific research and technological development of cars, cybersecurity, medical equipment, uh, climate modeling. So this is a, an all out war to prevent China from having a technological advantage over the U.S. He notes that the U.S., the new sanctions imposed by the Biden administration will block Chinese purchases of even years old chip making equipment and prevent American personnel from providing support or know how. This is this is the beginning of an economic iron curtain. The U.S. and the European Union have declared an economic iron curtain around Russia with these aggressive sanctions imposed over the proxy war in Ukraine. And now we see what this this guy, this former Pentagon official refers to as a dramatic escalation of the U.S. economic war in China, which is the beginning of the we're well, not even the beginning. It's the continuation of the economic iron curtain that the U.S. is trying to draw around China as well. And he says in order to justify this, the U.S. Department of Commerce made the same old national security arguments. He says that this is the U.S. policy toward China is effectively a form of economic containment. So we're back to the, the containment policy like during the first Cold War, although in many ways containment was always a euphemism and the real policy was rollback, that is regime change. And that is, of course, Washington's goal today is overthrowing the Chinese government. It's regime change. So he continues in this article. Again, this is John Bateman. He is the former Pentagon official who had senior level officials overseeing technology in the U.S. Department of Defense. He notes that U.S. officials have, quote, imposed disproportionate measures on China. So again, acknowledging that this is a one sided war. China is not responding with an economic war on the U.S. This is a one sided, disproportionate war. And he says the aggressive U.S. mindset all but guarantees a continued march toward broad based technological decoupling. And he notes that even U.S. capital flows into China, which Trump worked hard to expand as he, as he simultaneously cracked down on tech ties, are now facing new forms of federal pressure. So the tech war is part of also an economic war. Those things are both going on at the same time. And he notes that there are dangers of these, this very aggressive policy the U.S. has taken toward China. He warns that the next phase of decoupling could be more unpredictable and riskier. And he says the increasing boldness of U.S. unilateral actions and Washington's open embrace of a quasi containment strategy will draw reactions from many actors, including so-called allies of the U.S. So note here again, this is a Pentagon veteran acknowledging that the U.S. is engaging unilaterally. That is one is a one sided war on China. And he, he, he once again repeats that Washington has a containment strategy. Now, part of this containment strategy is the U.S. trying to bring other ally, allies and proxies into alliances against China. We see that with NATO. We see that with the so-called Quad or Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. That, that's an anti-China military alliance bringing together the U.S., uh, India, Japan, and uh, Australia. We see that also with the AUKUS military alliance of, the Austra of Australia, the U.K., and the U.S. against China. And also the U.S. is trying to make economic and technological alliances to counter China. As an example, the U.S. is creating a so-called chip for alliance with that is the U.S., South Korea, Taiwan and Japan. Those four regions, of course, Taiwan is part of China, but the U.S. is trying to support separatists. So Taiwan and the three countries, the U.S., Korea, South Korea and Japan, they produce the vast majority of the world's semiconductors. So the U.S. is trying to unite the semiconductor producers against China, but he noted that this actually has not been very successful. There have been internal conflicts. He also notes that the he refers to this U.S. Te tech war against China as a form of maximalism, and he warns that by flexing unilateral muscles so forcefully, the U.S. sanctions on China could cast doubt on U.S. willingness to accommodate differing interests. So he's saying that, that certain allies, 
may be afraid that the U.S. is going to take action against them and impose sanctions against them and punish them for refusing to take this maximalist hard line against China. Now, this Pentagon veteran acknowledges that this will come as no surprise to China's president, Xi Jinping, but he notes that it confirms the argument that Xi Jinping has been saying for years now that a hegemonic United States seeks to stifle China's normal development. That's obviously true. And China's been saying it. And then, you know, Western media says this is propaganda. The U.S. doesn't have a war in China. This is obviously an example of the U.S. war in China. And this Pentagon official acknowledges that many countries may be receptive to China's argument, judging from the global South's lukewarm response to U.S. led sanctions and trade restrictions against Russia. So he's obliquely admitting that the vast majority of the global South has not joined the U.S. led economic war on Russia. So it's unlikely, it's even less likely that they'll join the U.S. led economic war on China, especially considering that China's economy is the largest economy in the world, according to purchasing power parity measurement, which is much better than just GDP in dollars. And now it's actually a majority of countries in the world do more trade with China than they do with the U.S. And he continues here in this article saying that Washington has revealed a clear intent to suppress Chinese technological advances and a willingness to bear growing economic costs to do so. So the U.S. is waging economic war on China and is willing to make its own economy suffer in the process. He warns that even private actors are actually growing weary of this U.S. economic war on China and that it's sometimes opaque, unpredictable, irregular, and uninformed. And he says, in the face of this uncertainty, firms and academic institutions may pull back from benign and beneficial areas of U.S.-China engagement. This is exactly what has happened. I'm going to come back to that thought in a second. He notes that U.S. businesses and universities may spurn high-skilled Chinese applicants who pose no real national security risk. risk. Again, this is exactly what has happened. I'm going to show an example of that in one second here. I'm just going to finish the, uh, the last note from his article here. This Pentagon official, John Bateman, points out that, anti, that the U.S. government's anti-China measures have been a one-way ratchet. Each new restriction or sanction simply ups the ante for the next one, empowering hardline voices in the process. So he acknowledges here that Biden is trying to fend off Republican attacks claiming he's weak on China. But this is all this is doing is it's forcing both parties to become more and more aggressive against China, take a harder and harder line, accelerating the new Cold War. And that, that's the end of his article. Again, this is an article in Foreign Policy, the voice of the Washington, D.C. establishment, written by a former Pentagon official, John Bateman. Now, in this article, he acknowledges that the U.S. economic and tech war in China is resulting in a significant decline in collaboration in important areas. One of those areas is research, academic institutions. We've seen a mass exodus of ethnic Chinese researchers from the United States. And, and by the way, we've seen that other researchers around the world are instead going to China instead of the United States because they're worried of this xenophobic racist crackdown, this McCarthyite crackdown on non-white, especially researchers. This is an article that was just published in the South China Morning Post on October 20th. It's titled, At least 1,400 U.S.-based ethnic Chinese scientists exited American institutions from mainland China. The article is based on a study that was done by researchers at Harvard, Princeton, and MIT, and they found a chilling effect resulting from U.S. government policies deterring research and academic activity by scientists of Chinese descent and suggests American research could suffer. And they, they quote a professor at Princeton who say we, an increase, we see an increase in that trend. The U.S. is losing talent to China for a while and particularly after the China initiative. This is a Trump era initiative that they note that 
that the Trump administration was taking this very aggressive, borderline racist policy, accusing researchers in the U.S. of Chinese descent of stealing technical secrets and violating intellectual property rights. And this article, again, notes that if this fear is not alleviated, if the xenophobia and racism and McCarthyism in U.S. universities continues to increase, there is a high risk that the U.S. will see underutilization of scientific talent and lose out to China and other countries. So just as that former Pentagon official acknowledged in Foreign Policy magazine, the U.S. is going to hurt itself economically, in terms of research, in terms of technological advancement. But the U.S. empire has made it clear that it is willing to, to take those costs in order to try to contain and weaken and eventually overthrow China's government. That's the U.S. goal. Regime change in order to install a right-wing regime to overthrow the Communist Party of China and install a right-wing puppet regime that will privatize all of the state-owned banks, all the state-owned land, all the state-owned companies, which represent around 40% of GDP. They will privatize the economy, sell everything off to Western corporations, just like the U.S. did in Russia after the overthrow of the Soviet Union in the 1990s forcing mass privatizations under alcoholic U.S. puppet Boris Yeltsin, selling every, all the state assets and, and natural resources to foreign corporations and, and capitalist oligarchs who became, you know, the, the billionaire oligarchs. That's the U.S. goal. That's what they want in China. Here is an article in Wired magazine that was just published this October. It also says very clearly what the U.S. goal. The title is U.S. Chip Sanctions Kneecap China's tech industry. So the goal is to kneecap China's economy and tech industry. Wired Magazine writes that the sweeping new controls that the U.S. imposed are designed to keep China's AI industry, artificial intelligence industry, stuck in the dark ages while the U.S. and other Western countries advance. It, it quotes someone from this neoconservative think tank in D.C., the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, which is funded by the weapons industry. It's funded by the U.S. government. It's funded by U.S. allies. This is one of the more hawkish neoconservative voices in Washington. So it quotes the guy, this guy, Gregory Allen, who's the director of the AI Governance Project. And he says, the United States is saying to China, AI technology is the future. We and our allies are going there and you can't come. So... The U.S. recognizes that artificial intelligence is going to be extremely important in the future, and the U.S. is trying to maintain its technological and economic hegemony and weaken China's influence by preventing it from technologically advancing in order to strengthen U.S. imperialism and weaken China's economy. This article in Wired Magazine also quotes a professor at Tufts University named Chris Miller, and he wrote the book on the U.S. technological war going on, the book is called the Ch it's called chip war the fight for the world's most critical technology he said that the u.s export blockade on china is unlike anything s since anything seen since the first cold war and he said the u.s logic is throwing sand in the gears so again using that term cold war it's an, it's an acknowledgement that the u.s is waging a new cold war on china and skipping down in this article it quotes an associate professor at the Copenhagen Business School named Douglas Fuller, and he studies China's tech industry. And he said to Wired Magazine, in the short term, these U.S. sanctions, what they intend to do is kneecap the high performance computing efforts of China. So the goal is to kneecap China's tech industry. This is the same conclusion of a, an, an electronics industry website called EE Times, which represents the voice of U.S. technology corporations. This article they published this October is titled, U.S. Chip Sanctions Put Temporary Checkmate on China. And they refer to this chip war. That's a, that's a term that a lot of these people are using, a chip war, which is part of the, the technology war the U.S. is waging. The latest U.S. salvo in the chip war against China will set back domestic chip makers by generations, while global supplies of semiconductors and fab tools will incur billions of dollars in lost sales 
because of a giant dent in demand out of China. And this is based on analysts they spoke to, analysts who work in the tech industry. The, the Joe Biden administration has strengthened Cold War measures from longer than 40 years ago. So once again, we see another mainstream media outlet referring to Cold War measures. The U.S. is waging a new Cold War on China. In this new rivalry, the U.S. aims to freeze China's advancement on a new front, chip technology that is critical for economic development and military superiority. It's based, based on a Cold War agreement, Cold War, first Cold War era agreement called the Vasenar Agreement. An analyst in the tech industry told this website that the U.S. sanctions have probably stymied the advancement of China's chip industry. And he said, quote, the sanctions put a temporary checkmate on China developing their foundry industry, industry at more advanced nodes. The latest measures are likely to set back China's largest chip maker, SMIC, by years. So this is an economic war. This is the U.S. is trying to destroy China's tech sector. The U.S. is trying to devastate China's economy to prevent China from growing, to hurt China economically, which means hurt average Chinese people, Chinese workers on behalf of Western corp U.S. corporations. We all know that U.S. politicians are bought and sold by their corporate donors, by large corporations, fossil fuel companies, banks, the tech industry, all these, you know, the health insurance industry, all of these big corporations dominate U.S. politics. They buy politicians because bribery is basically legal in the U.S. political system. And then those politicians enact these extremely aggressive policies to try to contain China and Russia, waging a new Cold War aimed at overthrowing their independent governments so U.S. corporations can exploit their natural resources, so they can privatize state assets. That's the goal. And once again, average Chinese people are going to suffer. Not only those ethnic Chinese researchers, academics who have been forced to leave the U.S. and face, you know, racist, uh, you know, attacks, McCarthyite attacks and FBI harassment and all of that. It's not only hurting them, it's going to hurt the, the Chinese economy. But at the end of the day, I should also say that China is not going to be able to be pushed around. China is the largest economy in the world. And I think the U.S. empire consistently overestimates how powerful it is with its imperial hubris and underestimates the power of China and to a lesser extent Russia, but especially China economically, because it's on a whole different level compared to Russia economically. Russia is a significant military power. It's a significant political and diplomatic power. It has significant influence in certain industries, the fossil fuel sector, the you know grains and wheat minerals but in terms of the overall global economy china is actually larger than the u.s economy it is the manufacturing center of the world so the u.s thinks that it can contain china economically but we'll see how that actually ends up as as all these articles said in the short term this is going to very much hurt the the chinese tech sector but in the medium term and the long term We'll see who actually wins out. I'll have to say, I'm not a gambling man, but if I had to put my money on, on one side, I think China is most definitely going to win out. If you look at how U.S. government policy has just been completely bought and, bought and sold by large corporations, education has been systematically underfunded, everything has been privatized, everything is done in the short term. No one thinks in the medium term, yet alone the long term, because it's all about maximizing corporate profits in the short term, maximizing rent extraction just destroying any institution in order to suck wealth out of it. That's what all of these vulture funds do. That's what all of these hedge funds do. They don't produce anything. They are parasitic. The U.S. economy is based on parasitic finance and destruction and rent seeking and not production. So in the medium to the long term, I think the U.S. is going to do significant economic damage to itself. And of course, the rest of the world is going to be impacted by this because it's not just the U.S. and China. These are the two world's largest economies, and they are inextricably linked to every other country on the planet and the global economic system. So the U.S. is throwing these massive wrenches in the gears and the architecture of the global economy, and everyone's going to suffer. And as that former Pentagon official acknowledged in the foreign policy policy, 
article that I looked at, as, that I analyzed, this is a unilateral new Cold War being waged by the U.S. It is unilateral. China is not waging this new Cold War. China sometimes responds in self-defense, but it is Washington that is threatening global stability in order to try to maintain its imperial hegemony.